thanks for joining us. No, I'm absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Obviously, you know, it's it's an interesting and sort of strange time we're in, but I think in general, sort of connecting with people and sharing ideas is always good. And you know, I've done some similar sort of stuff in the past and I always find I get a lot out of it as well because you always get asked some interesting questions that make you think of things in a different perspective so you know I think every, hopefully everyone including myself can take something from it. Brilliant yeah your your journey and your pathway is is really really unique um, I'm not going to start in chronological order I'll kind of bounce all over the place but I want to start with the culture question which you know in the US, we talk a lot about coaches implementing a culture, coming in, taking over a team and, and putting their own spin on it and putting their own impact. Um, what can you tell us about your own journey, about how a coach must adapt to a culture? Yeah, I think, you know, everyone talks about culture and obviously, you know, putting your imprint, that's why you've been brought into a position, you know, regardless of whether that's it senior or junior or whatever country it is, I think people, you know, want you to come in and, and put your personality and your beliefs into your work. But I think the big thing about it is, is, you know, the first thing when you go into a place, and I've learned this over the years, and I understand it better now than I ever have, is that, you know, just because I do something a certain way doesn't necessarily mean it's better than something else that I might find there. So, you know, you go in and, and I've worked all over the world now from, you know, Europe, both East and West to North America, to Africa and Asia. And I think the really important thing is going in and assessing what you find there. You know, don't assume that, you know, we know everything as coaches. You know, all of us have some sort of ego. I think that's the nature of, of sport and especially professional sport. And so we believe in what we're doing, but at the same time, it's important to go in and assess the situation and, and see, okay, what is good here? What should remain? Because if you go into a situation and try to sort of lock, stock and barrel change everything and just go in and say, no, everything has to be my way, then I think the walls are going to go up very quickly and people are going to sort of rail against what you're trying to do and it can almost be especially when you're talking about different countries to go and do that is almost a little bit disrespectful because it's you're the foreigner you know sort of coming in and, and saying well I know what's best so for me it's really about you know it's important so important to assess the situation you know what is good here what are the needs and yes we have our idea of the game you know I have my idea of how the game should be played and how that should be the application of those ideas but at the same time you always have to make small tweaks the way I, I sort of applied my footballing idea in Bangladesh is different than how I do it here you know the way the teams will play at the end of the day will be quite similar but how you get to that end point is quite different and I also think you know we talk about culture and you know, culture is about, you know, everyone coming together and everyone, you know, going in the same direction and sharing that common goal. But you've also got to, I think, understand that everybody has different motivations. You know, what motivates me is very different than what, than what, what might motivate my striker or what might motivate my assistant coach. You know, so it's important to understand what motivates people and to help them try and achieve that within that team dynamic. So, you know, I, I just think going back to the first thing I said, you know, we have our beliefs, we have, you know, our way of doing things, but it's important not to believe that's the only way of doing things and that it is better than everything else. You've got to go in and assess. And, you know, I think I am better for every single environment I've been in because I've taken something from them. Yes, I've tried to impart something to them, to give something to those environments, but I also think I've taken a lot from them as well. It's interesting. Like um, I was reading there last week or week before. I was doing a fair bit of reading on Ancelotti. I just thought when you're looking at culture, someone who's really flexible and comes in and adapts to mm -hmm. different leagues, different players, uh, but then I'm – you obviously don't get it with the with the articles, but I was interested in asking you what are the what what do you prioritize or what are the consistencies or what do you take are the non negotiables that you bring to a culture that kind of 
uh, that I suppose represent yourself? Well, I think, you know, there's almost two parts to that just there. You know, um, the first thing is what do you prioritize? I think the first thing is getting to know people, getting to know them. And I don't just mean getting to know their footballing beliefs, but trying to get to know as many people as possible. Um, when I came into this job in my first two and a half days, I think I met with my technical staff because they were all in country. So there was six or seven in that meeting. And then over the following two days, I had about 80 phone calls to all our players playing around the world. And those players, those phone calls were anything between sort of six or seven minutes through to 20 minutes long. So it was two days solid of being on the phone. And only the first 5% of that conversation was me introducing myself. The rest of it was you know, what do you think we need to do to improve Ugandan football? What do you think needs to change? And, you know, I wanted to hear from people. I wanted to see their perspective on things. So for me, the prioritization is opening those lines of communication and making sure that people from the very first moment understand that it's a sort of safe space to share their opinion. That Because sometimes, you know, it's maybe an old school way of thinking, but um, some in certain countries, it's still that nature of when the coach talks, that is law, and that the players can't ask questions. But actually, it's so important because you've got to, you know, it's not me achieving anything on my own. If we're going to be successful, it has to be everybody together. If we have one weak part, it's a bit like a car engine, I sometimes say, because if there's one faulty part in the engine, the whole thing's going to spoil. And so we need everyone working together and working in unison, but we can only do that if people feel comfortable that they're part of a team. And then in terms of the non-negotiables, you know, for me, they're all things that actually have nothing to do with football. You know, they're things just in life. It's, you know, high standards. You know, some people are sometimes surprised at how inflexible I am in terms of our standards, you know, and that doesn't mean I hold grudges against people. If someone drops below our standards and has to be excluded or whatever it happens to be, you know, once they're, they've served their penance, they can come back in and it's finished. You know, it'll never be brought up again. But our, our standards are so important. And, you know, that links in together with the idea of work ethic. You know, people need to come and, and, and go to work every day and, and give it everything they really have. And, and also with the players and even, you know, myself, coaches, players, having you know that growth mindset you know some people you know that idea of willing to learn and it's interesting and now it's a non-negotiable willing to learn is a non-negotiable along the journey in my first game with a team if i find somebody who i think doesn't have a growth mindset am i going to get him out of the team on day one no i'm not because there's a balancing act but over the over the course what you're going to find is the starting 11 and the 20-man squad that we have is going to be filled with people who have a real desire to learn. And, and that happens over time. And then, and then ultimately just respect. For me, you know, respect of your colleagues, respect of the position that you have within football, within society. Um, you know, I just think, and these are all things that, you know, I could be, you know, a businessman, I could be a manager of a bank, you know, all of, I always say that, you know, I just happen to coach football. Football is what I'm good at. But actually, I think what I do is I try to improve people, you know, and football just happens to be the vehicle for doing that. And, um, and yes, yeah, so those sort of standards, I think, are applicable across a whole range of environments and, and work environments. Brilliant. When we're young coaches, um, we tend to look at our journey and map it out in terms of where we want to go and where we want to get to. I mean, yours is just so unique. Again, I keep using that word unique. Where do you, what, what was your mindset at the start of going out? And did you have a goals to attain at certain places? Or, or what, can you talk us through just what, what that, I suppose, what that opening phase of your coaching career was? Yeah, I actually remember it very clearly. I was I was actually talking about this earlier today with somebody. Um and it was, you know, I I started out very young. I I was 6 I was 15 when I took my first coaching session and did my first coaching certificates when I was 16. And 
you know, the rationale for that was I was pretty aware that I wasn't going to be a pro player. I felt I understood the game, but I, I wasn't at the technical level to, to, as everyone knows, growing up in Northern Ireland, if you want to be a pro player, you've got to have the level to jump across to England or Scotland at the age of 16, 17, 18. And, and that wasn't going to be me. Um, but I, I felt I knew the game and, and there was almost a bit of naivety to it at the time where I said, you know, I want to do this. I want to coach football. I don't want to be sat behind a desk every day. I want to be out on the grass with this ball at my feet. And, um, and I still remember the conversation with my careers advisor when I was sort of 16, 17. And when I said this and her response at the time was, oh, you mean you want to be a PE teacher? And I was like, no, that's not what I mean. I, I want to, I want to coach, you know, I want to coach at the pro level. I want to coach in the Premier League. I want to coach at the World Cup. And, um, and the response, which I completely understand is, well, that's not realistic because you got to remember this was, you know, before Jose Mourinho had arrived, you know, and there really wasn't a great list other than maybe like a, someone like Arrigo Saki. There wasn't a great list of people who had not been players at a top level who'd went on. And, and the feeling then was, oh, no, you've got to be a professional player first before you become a pro coach. And so I understood that. But for me, it was very much, look, if you can train to be a top doctor or a top lawyer, if you can train to do these things, then surely you can train and learn to become a top coach one day. And, and really, that's what I just said about in a very sort of, I think it helped that I was told it wasn't realistic because, you know, people who know me would tell you that, you know, I like a challenge. I like when people tell me it's not possible, I like to try and prove them wrong. And so had that careers advisor sat down with me and said, oh, yes, that's a very nice idea. Let's map out the next few years. You know, maybe it would have taken a different road, but the fact that she sat there and said it wasn't realistic, I needed to have more reasonable ambitions. There was something inside of me that said, no, I think I think I can go a lot further than this. And in terms of what the goals and ambitions were, it's just really, for me, it was how far can this go? Because, you know, look, already where I'm at now, you know, I still have so far to go in the game. Um, I've, there's so many things that I want to achieve, but even if this were to stop tomorrow, go back, you know, 18 years to that sort of 16 year old kid sat in that room already where we've got to is more than I was told was possible. So, you know, for me, it's just about, you know, seeing how far this can go. And, and, you know, I believe it's possible to go to a world cup. In fact, now, six, 18 years on from that conversation, I believe in this exact moment with the Ugandan team, it's possible to go to a World Cup. And so it's, it's just about driving forward and seeing how high up the mountain you can get. And if at some point we hit a glass ceiling with it, then that's okay. Because, you know, I think at the beginning, you're, I think all of us, as we get a bit older, at the very beginning, you're, you're focused on the, the end you're focused on where you can get to, but actually, as you set out on that road, you suddenly realize actually it's the getting there. That's the fun part. You know, it's the challenges and the obstacles you've got to overcome along the way. So yeah, I think it's just always been about how far can we take this and, and you know, how high we can reach. When, when we had Martin O'Neill on there last week or week before, we talked about the managing upwards and how that's now a challenge not just in football, but in business today as well. And with so many tiers of management. When I think of your situation and I've, I've read the interviews and I've listened to a, a couple of podcasts as well, the African football, um, the, the politics, and you, and you hear these horror stories almost in every World Cup with a different country about logistics not getting paid. There's always something. And how do you navigate around that level of management? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, first of all, it's, you know, it's been very refreshing coming to Uganda because here there's been absolutely no issues with that whatsoever. That's not to say it hasn't been there in previous roles where you definitely have to manage the people above you. But in, in this environment, I've been here close to eight months now and very much it's coach, it's your job, do it as you see fit. Um, whereas that hasn't always been the case in the past. But here it's, it's, it's remarkably refreshing that you're allowed to get on with it and, you know, 
as here, it's as long as you bring the results, then people are happy. Um, I do think as well, though, that, you know, you sort of said in terms of the, you know, different news articles and stuff, um, you know, you hear things about, you know, football in Africa and Asia and the politics of it. I actually think the reason people think that that's not to say it's not true. It is true. But I think it's true of the global game. Um, you know, I know a lot of people working in England, you know, at Premier League level and, and Championship level and even up in Scotland. And you hear not too dissimilar stories from them of the things they've got to deal with from the boardroom level to what you've got to deal with in some of the more developing football nations. I think it's just in um, when you're working in the Premier League or you're working in MLS, those stories don't come out. They're sort of kept to themselves to a degree. So um, it's definitely there all across the world. And I think really a big part of it is just, you know, say what you mean. Um, you know, don't try to talk around a subject, be direct with people. Um, clear communication, I think, in any organization is so vitally important, whether it's football or anything else. And then ultimately, you know, give them what you told them you were going to give them. You know, I think we all come into these positions and we, we pitch and we say, look, this is what I can bring to the table. And I think it's very important that when you get in there, if you're given the opportunity, that you don't suddenly change what you told them, that you go in and all along the way you can say, well, look, this is what I promised you I would deliver. This is how I said I would deliver it. And if it really is, if it's how you got the position in the first place, then I think you've got a much smoother ride. Whereas going in and promising A and delivering B, I think that is more open to those challenges and those problems along the way. Your background in sports science, really interested to hear this one, whenever um, we've kind of gone down a road of science financing available, is it something that you've learned to work with and adapt or is it something that you're always fighting for, listen, we need funding for this and funding for that. What, what, where do you sit on that there? Yeah, I think you'd be surprised at how, you know, that, you know, those, those mechanisms and that sort of facility is open to you. Um, I know definitely, okay, when I was in Eastern Europe, there was definitely maybe less going around and maybe the environment there wasn't so attuned to it. But, you know, coming into Africa, we brought a lot of sort of GPS and various technologies into the Rwandan national team. And here with Uganda, we have largely everything that's required. And the same when I went out to Bangladesh, um, the club owners basically said, you know, what do you need? What do you want? Um, let's get it for you. So really, you'd be surprised you know, at how forthcoming a lot of people are to embrace those new ideas. Um, I think one of the key things is obviously in any environment, you know, finance comes into it. So you've got the, you know, how impactful is a thing, you know, how cost effective is it? I think with a lot of the new things coming into the game, there's a whole range of, um, you know, options available to us. And so you've got to try and balance that up because, you know, do I get a new piece of, I don't know, you know, scouting software or do I employ another coach? You know, all of these are things that, you know, anyone involved in the game will understand that you can't have everything you want. Um, you've got to pick and choose what you think is best in your environment. I think probably the biggest challenge, though, is actually not the technology or the, the new innovations themselves. It's the staffing to utilize them because I could go out and get, you know, the best, GPS tracking technology on the planet that gives me, you know, reams and reams of data. But then I need staff who are going to interpret and analyze that data. You know, a lot of these more advanced sort of sports science um, and sort of football technologies, it can't be run by just one person. You, there's a reason Premier League teams and Bundesliga teams all have eight, nine, ten staff working in their first team sports science department. It's because the data is so, you know, significant and, and huge that it requires those people's eyes on it. So actually, it's less about getting the technology. That's often the easy bit. It's then getting the staff in to you know do that and then the added cost that that brings in. So it's about you know striking the right balance with that really. 
Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, another thing I want to ask you, again, regarding young coaches, when you're in your 20s, I be in general, you're normally then applying for a role in a club or you're applying for an assistant coach role. The level of pressure in that interview is not that significant. I uh, wanted to get your take on the pressure of trying to convince a governing body in a national team to hire you as a head coach. Uh, I mean, wh- what kind of things do you do for your presentation or or how do you, yeah, how do you go about that process? You see, you said an interesting thing there, Gary, about that, you know, if you're going and, you know, applying for an academy job or something, the pressure might be somewhat less. But I'm not so sure about that, because if if a young coach nowadays is going to, you know, apply to work for Manchester United, Arsenal, whoever it happens to be, their academy will coach in a very specific way. There's a certain type of coach that they want for their academy. So when you go into that interview, now I've not been in that interview at Manchester United, so I'm just guessing what it's like, but um, I'm sure a lot of people go into that and they're trying to get across that they fit the mold that this professional club's academy are looking for. I fit your profile of a coach. And because they know if they don't fit the profile of how that academy coaches, their mindset, if they don't fit that profile, well, then they're not going to get the job. So they're trying to, it's almost like they're made of Play-Doh and they're trying to shape themselves into what that academy wants. Um, Whereas for me, it was very different with the Sierra Leone job. And this is the same for all pro jobs, I believe, is that it's it's sort of like the difference between being a buyer and a seller. Um, If when I went into that room with Sierra Leone, I wasn't, I was selling myself. I basically went in and said, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. This is how I think we can change the team. This is how I think we can win the upcoming games. And we had a portfolio. We had one dossier on um, how I believe that I would evolve the team. And the other one was how we could win the upcoming games. And I, and I said to them, and I left those with them at the end of the interview. And I said, look, you can keep those, you know, that's several days work. You can keep them. Um, if you want me to execute them, then excellent. If you don't want me to execute them, no problem. You can give those to whoever you do give the job to because they might be helpful. But I think what people have to understand in coaching is that, you know, the X's and the O's and the tactics and all of this are only part of it. It's how you impart that message, you know. And so, yes, these things I'd put together were important. And they weren't trivial things. There had been a lot of work, but it was how, you know, I would deliver that message, I think, was equally important. And so when I went into the room, I was, you know, I was selling a vision and a football idea. And if the board of Sierra Leone FA had decided, no, we don't want to buy what he's selling, that's not what we're looking for. No problem. Because, and I've had this, you know, I've been in jobs before, you know, I've been in many interviews like that over the years since then. And that was the first one. But um, since then, I've met various clubs. And every time I've went in and I've, I've sold them what I believe in, and what I'm going to bring to the table. And some of them have turned around and said, we don't think it's the right fit. You know, we don't think it's the right fit for our club. And that's absolutely okay. Because if I were to go in, and I said it before about, you know, how do you manage upwards? You know, make sure you give them what you sold them, you know. So if I were to go in and I were to try to sort of, you know, create an image of myself that wasn't authentic and they were to give me the job based on that, well, then I've got to keep that pretense up for the entire two, three, four years. Because if I suddenly change, they'll be going, that's where problems occur. So I think in the senior job, I've always just went in and and said, look, this is me. This is what I believe. And this is who you're getting. And some people don't want that. And that's okay. But then the people who have wanted it, I think, you know, we've worked very well together. And for the periods of time we've been together, we've, we've been able to progress things and we've been able to achieve some level of success. But again, it's because they knew what they were getting from the very first day. Very interesting. 
Um, last one for me, and then I'll open it up. If you want to start putting your questions in, I'll, I'll get to them now after this one. Um, I, again, African football, uh, I could be wrong here, but it looks like the, the passion in the fans, the skill level, unbelievable. But the pitches, when you watch the African nations, uh, obviously with the, with the climate, seem very, very hard. Is, is there challenges trying to, with the travel and with the facilities in different places, is there challenges with trying to build a certain game that you want to tactically? Yeah, I think um, I'm sure a lot of us in football um, have read sort of is it Sun Shoes uh, Art of War mm. um, book where he talks about, you know, the things when you're going into war yourself, the enemy and the terrain. And really, that's very similar when you're preparing for a football match. Um, you've got to consider yourself and depending on what team you're with um, will be where the where that sliding scale is between yourself and the opposition. Um, when I've been with previous teams, um, where we've been weaker, maybe we've considered 40% us, 60% the opposition. Whereas now with Uganda, it's very much we're a team that we believe we can be on the front foot and we can dictate the tempo of games. And so it's 80% about us and 20% about the opposition, largely. Um, but then it comes into the terrain. What pitch are we going to be playing on? Um, are we going to be playing, you know, in in a time of the year where it's monsoon season? Are you going to be playing in the middle of the dry season? Um, so it always comes into it. You've got to consider. And for us, what we try to do as best possible is in the lead up to an international, make sure we're training on as similar a pitch to what we expect as, as possible. Even if that means taking a lower quality pitch than is available to us to train on, if we believe the pitch we're going to for an away game is going to be low quality, there's no point me playing on a you know five-star FIFA-graded pitch if I know I'm going to go to somewhere that's a lot you know less quality. So you've got to prepare yourself as best as possible. But even the other thing that's always interesting is even tournament football in Africa is, is very interesting. The pitches will change within a tournament. Um, Unfortunately, due to the outbreak, we were supposed to be in Cameroon right now playing in the African Nations Championship, which is sort of like a B-level tournament in Africa for domestically based players. Just imagine the African Cup of Nations, but you've got to be playing in your own country to be eligible. And um, it was due to be now, and we were preparing for our first game. And our preparation was that we would be playing on long grass in game one. Because what you find is it's easier to have long grass looking lush and green on the TV than it is to keep lovely bowling green short grass. And so it is often the case, if you watch the African Cup of Nations over the years, if you watch the opening round of games, often the games are very slow paced because the ball is moving slowly on longer grass. And then everybody complains that the grass is too long and then the grass gets cut. And then game day two, the pitches are normally more yellow because it's the shorter grass, but now the ball's moving faster. So even within a tournament, you've got to be prepared for those different conditions. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, a um, couple of questions here. One from one from Kieran. How do you get buy-in from players uh, that are from different uh, what do you, what do you offer different from other coaches in terms of how you approach buy-in? Do you offer anything different? Is it just a relationship? Yeah, I think you know football is such so relationship based. Um, I think players have got to understand that they can trust you, and um, that doesn't mean giving players everything they want. It's about being honest with them. It's about telling them up front and then being consistent. I'm making sure that if I've spoken to player A and said, look, we're maybe not going to play you or we're not going to call you up for the next national team squad because of A, B and C, but the door is open. If I then turn around the next time and call up a different player, despite those factors being similar or the same, well, all of a sudden I'm going to lose that first player. And he's going to talk to other players and it's going to be, oh, the coach said A, but he did B. And, and so I think as often as possible, you've got to just be straight with people and you've got to be honest with them. And, you know, sometimes you've got to tell people things that they don't want to hear. But as long as it's honest and it's genuine, I think people respect that. 
And and look, we're not in this game here. It would be lovely if all of my players liked me, but I don't chase it. You know, I would prefer they respected me rather than liked me on any sort of significant level. I think respect is the most important thing. So I give players that respect by being honest with them, by being upfront with them, by having difficult conversations when they're required. And I think you then get the respect back by players giving you what they have to give you. Henry, coach, we have many Ugandans living abroad that are currently involved in youth soccer development club management, college soccer, how can they be involved in the development of the game in Uganda? Yeah, I think this is one of the big things that currently the here in Uganda, the Federation and myself, part of the plan, and it's actually one of the things we're able to work on now with the lockdown. Over the next 18 months, we were looking at really strategizing how we'd link up all of the different national teams, how we can have a common playing model through under 15s to the senior team, both men and women's, you know, how they might differ between the men and women's game, you know, and our various sort of standards that we would implement. And that would have far reaching impact in terms of our recruitment of staff, of players. But also part of that has to be how do we identify players out in the diaspora, you know, globally, because Uganda has maybe been slow at doing that over the years. Um, now in the squad, you're starting to see that there are players having success who were born abroad or who moved abroad at a young age. Um, and I think not only do we have to try and identify that at the senior level, but also identify it at the junior levels as well. So if there's people playing you know, college level abroad or somewhere abroad, how do we, how do we involve them? in our long-term model because you know a player who we bring into our system at 17 years of age 16 years of age is going to grow with us so by the time they hit the senior national team they should already be well versed in our standards and our working practices and our expectations as opposed to them missing all of that and then joining in when they're 21 22 still obviously there will be players who join in at a later stage but if we can sort of integrate them in that culture and that working practice earlier then then it's going to be very important for us uh christos has asked uh basically is your pathway national team management is were you still open to club management in the future yeah, obviously, at this point, this is my third national team job, but I have had two club jobs. So after I left uh, the Rwanda national team, I worked in Eastern Europe um, with a team called FK Kano Zaldras. And then I went out to South Asia to work with Saif Sporting Club. So both positions, thoroughly enjoyable, um, left both teams on very good terms, very good relationships have been built, even to the point where they'll reach out and ask for recommendations on players. But um, it's really about the opportunity. You know, for me, I don't necessarily differentiate too much between international and club football. There are pros and cons to both. I think, you know, everyone knows that at international level, you have less contact with your players, but also you have a lot more time to prepare the fine detail, you know, and I'm a very detail oriented person. And when you're playing two games a week, you know, for 10 weeks in a row at club level, a bit like the English championship, your ability to go into that fine detail is, is a real challenge. It really is. Um, whereas at international level, you don't have that time constraint. But then the flip side of the coin is your contact time with your players. So, you know, I think there's pros and cons to both roles. But, you know, for me, it's always about the opportunity. And, you know, I was having a great time. I was I felt we were having a lot of progress out in South Asia and Bangladesh. But you know, when the Ugandan job became an opportunity, it was very much, you know, this is a country now who are perennial qualifiers to the African Cup of Nations, and we have realistic ambitions to qualify for our first ever World Cup. And so when you present that type of opportunity, I think it's very difficult to say no to it. Eduardo from Brazil has asked about those those club jobs and, and all that travel, how do you cope with the language barrier? Um, I think you try and learn bits of the language. You know, for me, I am not a great sort of linguistic person, unfortunately. It's one of those things from high school. I was never at the strongest in my foreign language classes. 
Um, I think it is easier when you're integrated in a country. When I was in Sierra Leone for five years, I was pretty fluent at speaking Creole. And um, by the time I got the national team job uh, three and a half years in, which surprised a lot of the national team players <laughs> that I understood when they were making a joke in the background. So it shocked a few of them. Um, but it does take time. Um, you've got the thing is, it's a balance. You know, I'm not sure if anyone heard Gary Neville speak recently. He was reflecting on his time at Valencia. And when he went in, he, he said how actually he, he went in and he was doing two or three Spanish classes a week when actually, given the point of the season they were at, if he could do it again, he'd shelve the Spanish classes until the off-season when he had a bit more time and he'd focus on the coaching and he'd just get people around him who were you know, very fluent in English and Spanish um, to get over that first phase. So it's the balance about time on the field and contact with the players. But yes, you have to make an effort. If you don't make an effort, even to learn you know, the basic amount, I think... I think eventually that will catch you out. So you've got to make an effort. Um, and if you make an effort, then I think the local players and the local environment will also make the effort to come and meet you halfway. Um, but then you've got all the other, there's translators, there's, um, you know, I've been quite fortunate that I've worked with a number of staff over the years who've been, who've had a good level of English. So even if you're going into the more complex stuff, maybe in a tactical meeting, they're able to translate it for the players. But beyond that, you're just trying to keep the message as simple as possible, which if you think back to your coach education, it's get in, get out in the shortest time possible. Don't give them, you know, a Shakespearean sonnet. Go in and give them the information they need in as succinct as way as possible. And to be honest with you, when you're in an environment where everything might need translated, you learn to become succinct very quickly. We've got a message from our good friend Rulani, who's he says talking to you earlier, and mm -hmm. he mentioned something interesting in regards to how he sees international football pro post COVID nineteen. Um, he's asking if he thinks it would be good if you a good idea if you shared that with the platform. Yeah, I think, look, I don't really think any of us know what the world's going to look like in terms of how we all operate day to day post this. Um, international sport, I think, is going to be interesting after this. Obviously, we have all of our FIFA windows set in place and the tournament dates set in place. But I think it's just going to be interesting how that's handled because, you know, for example, here in Uganda, we have only 55 cases to date. Um, our lockdown measures, our, our preventative measures have been working very well, we feel. Um, over the last three or four weeks, we have not seen that exponential growth in cases that a lot of countries have. And, you know, we're all hoping that that will continue and that we won't be hit with the worst of this virus like other countries have. However, if you think, let's say in six months time, say we get to um, the September or October internationals. Now, if we're due to play a game against a country who still does have an outbreak ongoing, how is that managed? You know, can we go to that country? Can they come to us? Does it have to be played in a neutral venue? You know, all of these questions that are being done on a domestic level with relation to professional sport, I think will continue to an international dimension longer because whilst we can control things within our own borders, we don't have control of things outside our borders. So, you know, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how international sport develops, you know, post this. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know is the answer, but I definitely think club football, no doubt, will come on board, will come back online first. And that will happen at different stages in different countries. Obviously, Rulani is in South Africa, um, but, you know, the South African League will probably get back to playing at a different time in the English league than a different time to the American league. Every country will be individual. and But international football then puts all those countries together. So how will that differing restart dates impact the international calendar? It, it's going to be interesting to see FIFA and the different sort of confederational bodies, how they deal with that. Aaron Thomas has asked in a really nice and respectful way, what do you do whenever 
the club players are on their club duty. What are you and your staff? Like, what's a, a weekly process for you? Uh, so for us, there's obviously different times of year. Um, when you're in the fall and winter, um, games are a little bit closer together. You generally have three weeks between international breaks. Whereas when you get into the sort of springtime, you know, if you think at the start of the year, you've got games in March and games in June, whereas the back end of the year, they're September, October, November. So when you're in the back end of the year, it's very much, you know, we'll, we'll spend, obviously we'll have been in quite an intense environment for 10 days because it very much is very intense and international week because you can't, you can't miss a beat. You've got to be on the, on the ball every moment of the day. You're sort of on call 24 seven to try and get the performance that we all need to be successful. And then after that, you know, people will have a few days to sort of relax and reflect. We'll come back in and then we'll start reviewing, you know, both we record our training sessions, we record the matches, you know, we'll look through everything with a fine tooth comb and see where did we meet our objectives? Where did we fall short? How can we do better in the future? And then, you know, two weeks out, you're now starting to look into the, you know, you're looking at players again, obviously, you know, who's fit, who's injured, who has, you know, performance at club levels, maybe peaked or, or, or troughed. And you have to name a national team squad again, because international squads have to be sent out two weeks before training camp starts. So that's three weeks before match day. You've got to inform the clubs of your squad list to you know, organizing all of that. And then you're really into the planning of that specific training week now. Okay, what are we doing? What are we going to do? Because we want to have as much of the logistical and administration and planning stuff done before any of the players set foot in training camp because we don't want to be planning anything. Yes, we'll make some small tweaks to training sessions, but we want to have that all done before anyone sets foot in the hotel. The reason for that is we want to dedicate all of our time to the players. You know, if a player wants to have a 10 minute chat, we want to be able to say yes. If a player wants to go and look at something on the video, we want to say yes. And if we still have planning objectives to do during that week, then we wouldn't be able to give the players that 100% attention during that week. So that's our sort of model for it. You know, all of our analysis of ourselves, of the opposition, of players' club performances is all done before they set foot in camp. So that And so actually camp tends to be, it's full on, but it's also relaxed in other ways because you're not having to run around, do 10 different things. You're simply giving your entire focus to the team and the players. And then in the longer periods of time, you know, between the spring and the summer internationals, again, you're getting out, you're watching as many games as possible. You're looking at developing, you know, how do you link in with the junior national teams? You know, how can you develop playing models? There's a, you know, how can you support coach development? One of the things we've done here in Uganda in the last few months is, is create pathways for Ugandan coaches to go and do their UEFA coaching badges in Europe. So it's all about developing the game as well. Brilliant. On those coach development, a couple of people have asked you about your own personal uh, coach development. You've um, you've done some work uh, with the IFA as well. You you have you travelled back and forth doing your badges there? Is you, are you doing stuff in Africa too? Yeah, no, I've done all of my um, main line, sort of the mainstream qualifications through the Irish Football Association. So I've always travelled back to Belfast from doing my B license to then my A license. I was living in the United States when I was doing that in New York. And then my pro license, I was living here in Africa. So um, and you can't miss anything. His pro licenses, I think there was eight get-togethers over the course of the year. So I remember one day actually flying back to Dublin and getting in the previous night. I think I got in at like eight o'clock on the, on the, I think it was the Saturday night driving back up to Belfast, there then being a performance analysis workshop for like six hours on the Sunday. And then on the Sunday night, I was on a flight back to Rwanda was at the time. And so I was literally in country for 24 hours to do a six hour performance analysis workshop. Um, so yeah, that took a lot of, you know, a lot of commitment to do the pro license. But um, beyond that, it's just, you know, I try to access as many sources of information as possible. Um, you know, whether it's 
doing periodization courses, whether it's doing sports science courses. You know, I recently, you know, have been doing stuff with, I think people might be aware of Barcelona, have their sort of FCB sort of universitas and um, where you can do sort of like four month modules with uh, Barcelona's university. So things like that, it, it's constantly trying to gain access to new information um, because, you know, for me, I'm a big, as I said earlier, I'm a details sort of oriented person. Um, I believe you can never have enough information. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed to make the correct decision. But the more information you have and the more knowledge you have, I think puts you in a better position to make a decision when it's required. Because to be honest, at this end of the game, um, often decisions are required in a very short space of time. You know, sometimes maybe at the academy level, you can take two or three days to make a decision. And in the professional game, you often have to make a decision, you know, in a very short window whether do we want to sign this player? Do we not? Do we, you know, this player's picked up a knock? How do we deal with it? It, it needs to be dealt with there and then. Yeah, last couple for you. A couple of good ones. Franz asked yeah. about whether the the lack of day-to-day, you always hear this on Sky Sports News, uh, can frustrate internationals managers. Does it, does it become a challenge for you? Yeah, look, I, I love being out on the grass. It's the best part of the job. Um, some people, I think when you're when you're maybe a young coach, and I definitely know this was me when I was a young coach, that you saw you know, the coach on the sidelines and you sort of thought, oh, match day playing in front of, you know, and I've been very fortunate, you know, I've, you know, my teams play in front of, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people. And, and everyone sees that and they think, oh, wow, the atmosphere of that and all. And, and you know what, when I was younger, absolutely. And when I first got the Sierra Leone job, that was a big thing for me. And, you know, okay, to this day, I'm hugely appreciative of full stadiums. You would rather play in front of 50,000 people than 50 people. However, you very much do, you just blank it out. And actually match day is one of those things that you're so focused, you have to completely release um, control of the situation to these men that you've worked with all week or all month in a club environment. And, and let them go and execute. And for me, it's all about actually the result pales in, in comparison to are they doing what we've worked on on the training field all week? Are they executing? Are they applying what we've been teaching them all week? And so for me, you know, being on the grass is the best part of the job. And so there's no doubt about it that, you know, being away from that at international level is, you know, it can be frustrating at times. But I also get a lot of joy of working with other coaches. You know, I, I like helping other people to learn. I help. I like helping people to grow. And I said, you know, at the very beginning of our conversation, you know, I think what I actually do in life is try to help other people reach their potential. And it just happens to be football is the vehicle for that. One vehicle is on the grass every day with players. Another vehicle is picking up the phone. You know, I speak to most of our players at least once every two weeks, but I try to speak to them every week. Um, you know, whether that's a five, 10 minute conversation, a FaceTime, you know, I try to speak to everybody to see how we can support them. You know, is there a supplementary role we can play in addition to what the clubs are giving them? And, you know, and that's been great because they've already been used to that. And now we come into this current situation where they're in the house all of the time. And so actually our working practice with the players in terms of our weekly contact actually hasn't changed from what it was previously to what it is now. The content's changed a little bit. But so there's other ways you can have an impact on performance than on the grass. But but look, definitely, if you said to me, could I have my Ugandan players every day for a month on the grass, I, I would take it in a heartbeat. Okay. Last one. This has been fantastic. Last one. I think this will make you laugh. Gareth has put in, if you could give Coach Johnny from Northumbria a third team one piece of advice you know now, what would it be? Um, if it's if it's Gareth, who I think it is, um, <laughs> and he might, he might not like hearing this, um, don't let sentiment get in the way of, of, of decisions. Um, if I go back all the way back to that time, um, that team was very successful. Um, I was young. I was only 22. All the guys were 18, 19, 21, 22. 
and we won the the Busa Championship. It's the only time Northumbria has ever won it. Um, and those boys came along on a journey. I can still remember my first team talk to them. I can still remember my last team talk to them. Um, and even now, I'm still very good friends with a number of them. Um, but I do remember that cup final, that championship game. We were 3-1 up going into the last sort of 15 minutes. And I made a substitution on sentimental reasons. Um, and it, it, um, we conceded to make it 3-2. And um, then we really were holding on. We ended up winning the game. We won 3-2. But definitely the last 15 minutes were a lot tighter than they needed to be. And after, like, to make this substitution, we changed the formation. We changed from a 4-4-2 to a 3-5-2 uh, to make the substitution. And, and I think all of the players afterwards were like, Johnny, what were you doing? You know, we've never played 3-5-2. Why make that substitution? But, um, you know, I, I felt that someone deserved to play because of what they'd given us all season and they hadn't made the starting lineup. And, and so on, a, on an emotional level and on a human level, they deserved to be on that football pitch. But the decision was made on those terms as opposed to what is happening in front of me in the game. And so as, as sort of cold-hearted as that may sound, you know, I think the one thing I learned, I learned many things with that group. They were a great group of players. But um, one thing I did learn was um, the hard lesson was that, you know, we could have lost that cup final and it would have been my fault had we lost it. Um, and so you sort of have to take the, the sentiment and the emotion out of it, unfortunately. Brilliant, brilliant. I hope it wasn't a stick Gareth on there. He'd be good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. Johnny, first class. Love this. Time has flown. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we wish you all the best and we'll hopefully get you on again. No, thank you very much, Gary. And, and like I said, um, you know, I think these things are always great for everybody. Um, and one thing I say, I think nowadays in this current environment, everyone's connecting with each other a lot more, which I, I think do more of it and keep doing it. Um, like I know for me, I get a lot of messages on LinkedIn and on, you know, sometimes emails that come through. And, you know, I try to get back to them all because I know as a young coach, I would have, you know, wanted people to get back to me. Um, and I value massively the ones that did. Um, you know, over my time, there's been some managers, top managers who've been very gracious with their time. Um, Roy Hodgson springs to mind as one of them, amazingly gracious with his time. And, um, and I value that, you know, greatly. And so I try to give that back to other people. You know, I, I don't guarantee you'll get a, a response to me from me within 24 hours, but if something comes in, I try to flag it. And sometimes it does take me two or three weeks to get back to people just depending on what our, our program is at that time. But I, I do try because I think, you know, everyone can learn from everybody else. And, and so what's happening now in terms of us connecting with people in the game, I think hopefully one thing that comes out of this sort of really tough period we're in is that we're all a lot closer and we share a lot more information that we, than we've ever done before. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well said. Great stuff, Johnny. Uh, stay safe and we'll talk to you soon.